That was close. The people at uh, Ballet's are very protective, as they ought to be, by the way, of George Carlin. And so getting through to him was, whew, man, it was really close, like within seconds here. But I think that we have done it. So coming up in a moment, the big C, <laughs> George Carlin. Well, normally I read some sort of bio on my guest, but if you don't know who George Carlin is, then <laughs> what can I tell you? Everybody knows who George Carlin is. And he just finished a show at Ballet, so here he is, George Carlin. Hi, George. Hello, Art. How are you? Um, uh, quite well, thank you. I, I do cut it kind of closely on your show. Oh, man, I'll tell you. I, I called Ballet's, and they are very protective of you, George. I got a, a lady who said, well, I can't do that. Um, let me get my supervisor. And really? So, yeah, they should get a supervisor. And then, well, we don't know if we can do that. We'll have to screen that call. And oh, yeah. Then I finally got through. Well, they screen out folks, except for folks like you are. Folks like you can always get through. <laughs> By the way, that reversing the aging, 10 years, 10 weeks. Yeah. How about if I, I'm 62, which is uh, 17 uh, Celsius. <laughs> How about if I take that stuff for 63 weeks? <laughs> Will I be a fetus? I, you might be. Um, I've often thought that uh, people that it's all backwards, that uh, we should not get older and more decrepit uh, going slowly away, but it should be reversed. Wouldn't it be great if you just wound up, uh, well, actually, you kind of do go downhill again anyway, some of us, you know. Well, you do, but it's not as though you're being enlightened more. You, no. might, you know, you might stare at a flower, but you don't get the same thing out of a child would. And concerning the 5 to 10 pounds of toxic matter in my intestinal tract, we all have that. Yeah, well, I have it over 60 pounds in my tracks. <laughs> some, I have some more in my pockets. Are you a meat eater? No, sir. I, I will eat uh, some uh, breast of chicken, uh, meat, turkey kind of things, and occasional fish. Because they tell me that uh, beef eaters have like 5 or 10 pounds or 20 pounds of beef, you know, undigested beef. Yeah. It's an ugly thought. And their bodies smell like it. I don't mean to be disgusting. I just mean that they have a kind of a body odor that's, that's really, uh, beef, I think, more, uh, more beef, noticeable. Beef, beefy. Yes. <laughs> uh, why do you do what you do? Well, uh, some of it is genetic, and I have instincts and um, skills, you know, or, or some people call them gifts when they talk about their own uh, talents. I think of them as skills. Uh, my mother and father were both very funny people conversationally. Uh, my dad was an after-dinner speaker. I didn't know him. He was, he was asked to leave early. Uh, he apparently couldn't metabolize ethanol very well. <laughs> so he, he was uh, he was shown the door early. I see. But but they were both very funny. My mother, who I did have in my life as a youngster, my mother could come home from work uh, riding the bus in New York City, and uh, she could tell you a story that happened. Something happened on the bus, and she could do three or four voices of the people, and she'd improve everything they said, and she'd always have a punchline, <laughs> a great punchline. So. There's a genetic strain, uh, and, and particularly I think the Irish have a, have a gift to that. And so I have pretty much, a, I couldn't help it. I, I found that I, it got me a lot of attention and approval as a, as a youngster. I, I lived uh, kind of a lonesome life, which I enjoyed. But um, What about I, school? I mean, were you like that in school? Because oh, that oh, gets you yeah. in a lot of trouble. Oh, sure. I was a class clown, Yeah. Uh, as they say. And, in fact, I had an album by that title at one time that, uh, that, that did very well for me. And, uh, yeah, I, my, uh, my attitude in school was that as long as I wasn't going to get an education, why should these other children get one? <laughs> so, I don't know if that was my attitude, but I did that, too. I, I constantly asked uh, irrelevant questions. Oh, yes. Or, or, in my case, a Catholic school, pointed questions. Pointed questions. If God is so powerful, can he make a rock that he himself can't lift? They used to love me. Yeah, that's a terrible question. <laughs> there's, there's another one you asked. Something about if uh, God were to take acid, would he see people? Wow, that's nice. I, I, I love switches like that. Simple <laughs> humor switches. I never thought of that one. No? <laughs> no, that wasn't mine. I wonder if he would, though. Uh, he'd probably see only the, the finest people. You talk a lot about God. Do you really believe in God? No, no, I don't. I, no? I talk about him as an object in our culture. You don't think there's a God? Uh, I can't believe that there's a man in the sky keeping score who watches everything we do and has a little scorecard. Uh, it just seems beyond. there might be a, a kind of an organizing intelligence. Somehow the universe seems to have an order to it. But I don't know that it's a judgmental or, a, or one that really gives a crap 
Not well, supposed just, to, yeah, the fear God thing. I don't buy into that. Oh either. my! Well, I mean, it's it's. I think it's very limiting. I think the belief in God is a form of mental illness. It's a very uh, limiting form of uh, it, the intellect, the, the wonderful intellect that nature has given us. I use the word nature uh, has given us uh, is compromised by surrendering things to the will of God. You know that we don't have any say. Well, well, it didn't happen. My prayer didn't come through. It must be God's will, and and that relieves you of responsibility. I I don't believe that. But you think there is something. In other words, there is some sort of order, and that well, and that, that means there has to be something, right? Well, I wouldn't say I think it. I'd say it would not surprise me. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a, a questioner, and I'm in some ways credulous too. And it it just seems though as if. Um, that there is um, there is a kind of order that we can't explain that is um, you know beyond our our, our ken. Well, how, how can we ever expect as this, this lowly clay that rose to this level to understand something that uh, that beyond? I, it's just, I'd rather just stand here and wonder and, and not try to put a, a, a name on it. Do you wonder about after you die? Whether there will be anything or nothing? Well, I do wonder about that. Uh, and I also wonder why there isn't just nothing now. Why are there things at all? Why do we have matter? Why is there anything? That was, I used to sit in school. That was one of the things that got me in trouble in school, sitting there daydreaming. But that goes back to God, see. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it can. <laughs> it can. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful thing that we have these minds and we can consider this. These things, these, this stuff, um, but it can drive you a little crazy, Art. I, there's a gazillion things I could think to ask you about today. The president came out today and said that uh, Y2K is not going to be a problem. <laughs> and then his own committee said that half of the 911 systems in the U.S. are not compliant. And the president said our savings and our safety are intact. No yeah. problem. Well, the 911 thing is great because those that's where the, the guns are. You know, those are the people with the guns that they're, they're trying to corral <laughs> and people who get shot and, and hurt. That's right. uh, I, I root for big uh, problems all the time. I root for disasters. I root actually for the end of all of this because I think it's an interesting scenario uh, for things to wind down. I think we're already circling the drain uh, as a species, and, uh, and I would I love to see the circles get a little faster and a little shorter. So you're rooting for disasters? I do, sort of, just for my entertainment. It's a very selfish thing. But I, I sort of root that, um, that, that I, I mean, I love an earthquake. I love a bigger earthquake. They're never as big as I'd like. Have you, have you ever been in one? Yeah, well, they're not very big. I was in two of those California ones, the one in uh, the early 70s. And then the one that we had here, I don't know what, uh, 10 years ago, 8, something. Well, you're, you're, you're just over the hill in Las Vegas. Let me tell you, we had a pretty damn good one, 7 point whatever it was, uh, uh, just a couple, three weeks ago, whatever. No, we and, need a 25. Do you, I think of it as an amusement park ride, all right? It's it, it really, I, I mean, it's such a wonderful thing to realize you have absolutely no control and, and to see the dresser move across the bedroom floor un, unassisted, uh, it just, it, to me, it's, it's a very exciting thing. And, and I'll tell you the truth, I never got scared in either quake I was in. I did go, I did uh, cover my wife with my body, you know, kind of an instinctive thing. I rolled over in the bed and kind of covered her. I thought the ceiling might fall in or something. Uh -huh. And our daughter ran in, Kelly ran in, when, when, this was the one in the early 70s. She was, she was about 9 or 10. But um, but I honestly felt, gee, disappointed when it was over, that it wasn't bigger. And I looked out, and I, I, you know, there wasn't enough destruction. I really think there's great human drama in destruction and in nature unleashed, and, and I don't get enough of it. Uh, George, a 25 would turn uh, entire continents over. Ah, uh, now you're talking hard. You know what we never have either is a really good big tidal wave. Can you imagine the tsunami we would have out of a 25? Oh, yeah. There it would be nothing left. I know. It's just wonderful to consider. Well, there are scientists, by the way, who do consider that every now and then there is a complete extinction. Everything goes. Yep. And everything begins again. Well, uh, you know, if you're, if you're talking about uh, 65 million years ago with the reptiles and all, I that'd mean, be one. I, that's certainly uh, a possible random achievement that we could attain and to have one of those fellas hit us. And I read once, uh, by the way, I was very disappointed that the bolide didn't hit on June 30th. I want you to know I listen uh, as often as I can, Art. It's not regular, 
but it's probably two or three times a month. So you were hoping for it? I was hoping that the bolide would be on time, and then I was hoping when it didn't show up on June 30th that at least Nostradamus would be correct with July 6th, and then that didn't happen, and I wondered what Father Charlie Moore was going to tell the people, because he was quite, you know... Specific, emphatic. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was, yeah. But, but I would like to see, uh, and I want it to happen a little east of me so that the prevailing winds carry this, the destruction around a little bit late, and I can watch some of it on CNN. I want to see the cities go out one at a time, London, Moscow, Tokyo, and then catch up to me. <laughs> you know, I'm having a little fun with this, but I, I honestly must tell you that I do enjoy uh, Disaster. big, big disasters. Big I really, disasters. And I always hope you know, that they're going to be a little bit bigger. That's incredible. Well, that must. The only reason for that could be that you have, you've more or less given up on the human race. Well, I, I, you know, the problem is when you scratch a cynic, you find a disappointed idealist underneath. Mm. And I will cop out to that. Uh, I'm sure there's some flame burning dimly in me that would like to see everything work, but. I, it doesn't look like that is what is in the cards. If we had another maybe 1,000 or 10,000 years to evolve, mm -hmm. and we got past this stuff of national borders with 168 countries or whatever it is, and 2,000 or 5,000 languages or whatever it is, and all of these rivalries, um, we could have a chance. Now, but you see, I had callers just before you came on who uh -huh. were talking about this. They're in great fear of it. They talk about the New World Order. They're talking about... I know. U.N. troops coming in yeah. and taking over the U.S. and the world and all, yeah. all of well, that? Well, you know something? When you're stuck in local time, that is when, you're, when your mind, your thoughts, your parameters are stuck in local time, you see things on a small level, on, on a limited basis. And I, but I think that if, if there is ever to be a golden age of this species, a, a true golden age, it will not include borders in 168 countries and 2,000 or 5,000 languages, whatever the real count is these days. Mm. It will not include those things. This is a very young, primitive species. The fact that our technology has raced eons ahead of us is interesting, and it gives us a lot of toys and things, but we're still very close to who we were 10,000 years ago. It's a drop in the bucket of time. So, in other words, you look at current social behavior, and it's not that much above caveman level. Well, uh, well, the, the inf I think the veneer is very thin. I mean, I think there's... So do I. Yeah, the uh, barbarism is, is less than a generation away. I really think that. Uh, I don't mean it's coming. I mean, under certain circumstances, it could be less than a generation away. The Mad Max thing. Yeah, yes. People, the roving bands of maniacs, I call them. The various roving bands of maniacs, they'll be all different kinds. They'll be the ones that got out of the insane asylum, mm. the ones that got out of the prisons. Then there'll be my people, the Scotch-Irish, who'll be wandering across the land looking for things to drink and your sister. They want to find your sister. Your sister. There'll be all manner of people running around. Uh, well, it could happen. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, let me just move you a little bit. You're in Las Vegas right now. Yes, sir. I've lived in and around Las Vegas for the last, I don't know, 15 years. Right. It has really changed. Every time somebody gets a bug, they blow up a building and put up a new one. Yes. What do you think of Las Vegas now? Well, I, I'm kind of separate from this uh, culture here. Uh, the, the, the one good thing, and, and I'll get back to your, the basic part of your question, the one good thing these days here is that there are really a lot of first-class restaurants now. There might be 20 to 30 uh, restaurants where you can really count on the food, um, but this is uh, this is what it what it shows itself to be. I don't, you know, I work in theaters primarily. I do about 100 or 120 theaters and concert halls a year. Most of them are about 2,500 seaters, and and that is my general uh, my general career along with my HBO shows. And I come here uh, about 10 or 12 weeks a year to give a little rest to those markets that I, I'm usually going to Seattle and Miami and sure. Pittsburgh. And you have to rest them a little bit. You can't be going back every year. So I get down. To, I can earn a little money here, and, um, and I can stay in one place for two or three weeks at a time. I don't have to pack every day. I can sure. write. I can oh, talk. sure. Yeah. So, so that's my reason for being here. But um, And that's the only reason I can tolerate it, because it does something <laughs> for me. It, it's tip for tat. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a schmoozer. I'm not a hangout guy. I never hung out with show business people. I don't know many of them. I don't have a lot of industry friends. 
I have a small circle of friends. Most of them are unrelated to, to show business. So here I'm a kind of alien. Uh, there's a topic for us. <laughs> yeah. I'm a kind of alien, and I... Um, Do you find you withdraw more and more and more? Oh, yes. Yeah. And I don't know if it's a function of age or intellect. Uh, my, you know, all of our intellect, it, it is to be hoped, uh, sharpen a little bit with age, and, and we, we get our, our perceptions a little clearer and, and what it is we need from the world clearer. But in my case, I can say it's happened that way. And I find that I, I'm in love now... Uh, with a woman, I'm, I'm engaged to a woman, uh, Sally, who, well, let me put it this way. Let me, let me get, bring you back just a few years. I had a wonderful marriage uh, with my wife, Brenda, for uh, 35, 36 years. We, well, we were together about 37 years. And, um, and, and Brenda died uh, to about two years ago. And uh, now I've fallen in love with Sally, and we are kind of separate from the world we have our own little uh, circle uh, of uh, it's, it's like about three people. <laughs> yeah, and and, and, that, and I love that. I really don't like the entanglements because people are, a lot of people are just they drag you down with their their agendas and their things that are on their minds and what they're concerned with. They 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 seem to have a lot of frivolous things they care about, and I don't care for all that worldly stuff. Well, I know. It, well, there's a problem with celebrity, uh, and yeah. I've, I've had a real problem dealing with that, George. Sure. Uh, it, it, you never really exactly know why people want to be your friend, and, and yeah. unfortunately, a lot, a lot of times it has to do with your celebrity. And sure. So it's tough. It's really tough. Well, well, unfortunately, I don't even. I never really. That circle of my radar is very acute, and I don't. There aren't many people who get past that circle who, if they're just really trying to suck up or be sycophantic or, or, or yeah. look for something. I mean, that they don't even get past the first ring. But but um, but uh, there are people who you can tell the difference between a genuine compliment you can and an artificial one. Still, yes, uh, there is a big price to pay sure. for for being famous, isn't there? Uh, there is, and then at the same time, may I point out because I'm a pretty positive with all that stuff I said about disasters and the end of the world. And the You're, well, hold on to the positive part. We'll, we'll get yeah. to that right after okay. the uh, the break. Bigger the disaster, the better. Hoping for a 25. What a 25 earthquake would be! It would be. Well, there would be no America, Europe, Japan, the Orient, all gone. African continent. Everything would go underwater. You wouldn't be watching anything on CNN. Nothing, because they wouldn't be there. Because there'd be no Atlanta. George Carlin is here, and we'll be right back. there and if he's coming back. Once again, here is George Carlin. Actually, I've always read disaster books, uh, gone to disaster movies, and I think most people, even though they don't admit it, are just like George, the bigger the disaster, the better. You know it. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of people are like that. They just, they, they don't admit it. 
No, there's, there are a lot of things like that uh, that they, they, they don't admit. But I, I understand that. They think they have to live up to something. Anyway, you do have some positive outlook about something, right? Now, yeah, you know, you're right, but I can't remember what I was segueing from. <laughs> what was the, negative, the last negative thing we were on that I was – the reason I said I, it was a positive thought. But Because I, I can make something up. If you've lost it, it couldn't have been too profound. Well, it was a profound connection, but I lost the connection. Uh, what I, I think well, I'm, we'll see if we can get back to it. I, I, I note on your HBO specials right. that you now, you do a lot of politics. Well, I call them social issues rather than, because politics to me means Democrat, Republican, and I don't do much of that. No. You right. know, I don't do a lot of topical stuff, but I do do things that are timely, you know, race, and love and war and hate and, and those kind of things. But it's not partisan. I don't talk about, you know, specific people. Speaking of war, you know, there's a big headline today that the U.S. Army, uh, two of its, it says two of our um, divisions, uh -huh. and we only have ten, yeah. are not prepared should there be a war. Well, good. It'll be more fun. <laughs> you know, um... I just wish I could think of that connection. Or, Damn, I'm mad at myself. Well, that's right. It'll come back to you. Yeah, but, but in the meantime, there's plenty of negative things we can. Cover. Absolutely, uh, but, but but I think. Well, let me just try and make a pass at the positive thing because I want sure. to say this much. I don't believe very much in groups. I don't like uh, yeah. the, what I call the clotting of human beings. Yeah. I really love individuals as I meet them one at a time. Uh, even a, a kind of an inane person or someone who's kind of goofy or, 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 is, or is even a kind of bad news, there's something interesting. Like a guy who just raped his dog is at least interesting. You look in his eyes and you kind of see something there. But it's the group. It's when they begin to surrender the beauty of the human individual mind to a group mind and group thought. Suddenly they start having little hats and little sayings and express, you know, uh, uh, passwords and they have a list of things they're going to do, and they have uh, fight songs and, and uh, team jackets and things. And I think they lose the beauty of individual humanity, which I believe in. I think we're a magnificent species. Are you not, though, somewhat in contradiction with yourself, though? Because yes. you, were, you earlier said that until we erase the borders, yes. the nationalism, all the rest of it, well, once you've done all that, You've got a bunch of people that are holding hands and, you know, talking about love, and that's it. Well, maybe, maybe not. Man. Maybe we're destined to do that. I mean, I, I can't uh, uh, sketch out the exact outcome that I would like. What I would love to see is that we get beyond these things that limit the human mind now. I think we put, we put restrictions on ourselves with these boundaries, not just political boundaries, but intellectual boundaries. I would love to see a completely anarchistic... Uh, human race, where everybody really gets to pursue everything they would like to. I, I don't know how that would ever work. We might need 10 million years. I don't think it's in the cards. I think we're a cursed species. I think we're a, we're a chemical accident, and I don't think there's any hope for us. The other thing, the, the other part of me, is just a wish part. That's just, oh, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be great? I don't believe... It, it really can happen. A chemical accident. We crawled, in other words, way back when, out of some mud puddle or the ocean uh, to become what we are now. Some catalytic agent took the, the ingredients and put them together, and it's probably happened oh. in, a, in a million or ten million or ten billion other places in the universe, and uh, it, it's, just, it's all just an accident. The interesting thing... Well, but, but, but if man evolved from monkeys and apes, yes. then why do we still have monkeys and apes? Ah, uh, you see... You got the good questions, Art, and I got the bad answer. <laughs> I mean, that really is a good question. If it was a, if, if things evolved, but they evolved to the left and to the right, not always in a straight line. I mean, there are branches. Obviously, there are what 400 different. I, I don't know how many species of mammals, uh, uh, and they all came after the reptiles. Uh, were destroyed by this presumed comet or asteroid mm. 65 million years ago. The ferret, there was something like a ferret-like animal, I believe, was about the largest mammal. And then we've, we've arisen since uh, from that point out into separate directions, left and right and forward. But some of these species hit a dead end, and some don't. Some, some of them are viable. The chimpanzee, the ape, the great apes are, are, are viable. But there aren't many primates. Uh, 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 That's there, true. There aren't I, I, I'll tell you something you can think about, disaster-wise. Mm -hmm. This is a good one. A lot of scientists now, Israeli scientists, really bright guys, uh -huh. think that it was not a big bolide that uh -huh. killed off all the dinosaurs. They think that the sun 
went through a cyclical time uh -huh. and through this immense radiation suddenly, and, and we now know stars do that. Every now and then, sure. what, what, what is a stable star will throw this immense radiation yeah. and virtually sterilize every living thing on the planet. Well, does, does that explain the, ir the iridium level? Because that's the... It only, might. Yeah. Well, that's, I haven't read that at all. I'd love to read more about that. Well, it could happen. And then in the sure. blink of an eye, I mean, literally, instantly, all life would cease. Yeah. Microbial life, everything. Would would this allow for for a, a, a good fossil record to be to be left? Because I, I don't know how the fossil record that we have matches that scenario as well as it might match the one. Well, we we might be future fuel. Well, <laughs> whether we'd be anything more than that, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Fertilizer. Listen, put me down for that one too. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Something. I don't mind. Whatever it is, if it destroys a lot of life, I'm a happy guy. Well, look, uh, there are a lot of environmental things going on right now that have that potential. I mean, yeah. you know, the Arctic is uh, the Antarctic is melting. The ice the, oh, the would seas so nice. would go up 20 feet. Yeah, I forget, I forget if it's the eastern or the western ice uh, shelf or whatever that might break off. If it does, that's right. It's wonderful because you have all new beachfront property. About here, actually. That's not bad. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I just think it's, very, it's stimulating to, to entertain these possibilities. And I really don't understand people who run around wringing their hands and saying, oh, wouldn't it be awful? Oh, this is terrible. I think, hey, you're here for the ride. This is an adventure. Yeah, I call it my entertainment. The file in my uh, computer on all of this stuff is called my entertainment. Philosophers have said for... For, I don't know, millennia, they've said, why are we here? And I'll tell you why I'm here. I'm here for the show. I want to see a good show while I'm here. And if it includes giving my life for the sake of entertainment, I'll go. Hmm. I'll go. This is such, you know, it's such a short-term deal. Well, then you're about to be really happy, a happy camper, because I think between now and the spring of 2000, yeah. a lot of stuff is going to come down. All right. Now, now let me... Let me ask you to clarify, but first let me tell you what I'm wondering myself. Because uh, you're probably, and I'm sure you are, better informed on this uh, issue than I. Well, well, I, I don't have, know about that. I, well, I have a smattering of information and, and speculation from people who have, have agendas, you know. Um, uh, my feeling is that, uh, that probably a lot of the, the larger major systems, at least in this country, have been uh, that the correction will take or they will have fairly simple corrections to come down the line. But I think there would be a lot of random, you know, like the, like the sewers will back up in, in one place and the power will go out in another place and mm -hmm. this will overflow there and that will go out here and there yep. will be randomized checkerboard patterns. That's right. And, and therefore somewhat chaotic, but maybe containable. I, I'm just wondering where that line is after which it really begins to send us back a hundred years. Well, I'll tell you where, if it would happen. Now, I don't know that it's going to, but we yeah. do know that there are hundreds of thousands of embedded chips. Now, that's not yes. software. Yeah, I know. Embedded chips right. in, in power companies across America. Right. If the power were to go off yeah. for two weeks or a month, right. then at some point, irreversible things would begin to happen. Well, sure, yeah. Uh, embedded. Now, I understand the, the idea because there are embedded chips in cars and coffee makers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you're talking about major systems. Yes, yeah, switching systems, power, well, power company things. Now, now, the power companies have obviously done what they can about those non-embedded uh, portions of the program. That's they, correct, yeah, sure. But you're saying that they're not telling us that there's a lot of stuff they just have to cross their fingers on. Well, we know there is, and they know it, too. Uh-huh. That's why they're buying generators, huh? Well, listen, I've got a really nice generator here. Uh-huh. And I didn't get worried until my power company came out and, and, and came in and said, listen, would you tell us, can we take a look at your generator system? We have a lot of customers asking about it. Uh -huh. I said, sure. I said, let's trade a little bit of information. You tell me. Uh, what kind of state you really think we're in. I want the real bottom line. Right. And what they told me was, well, we are prepared to leave the grid if we have to. If we, you know, see things going south, right. we will disconnect from the grid and provide local power for, I think he said, up to six weeks. Wow. And all power companies are bound, you know, they sign something that swears they'll stay on the grid. But all the power companies really... 
they're not, they're, you know, they're going to take care of their local customers if things begin to go south. Right, right. Now, one little power company in Idaho went down a few years ago, and the whole western third of the U.S. and Canada and That's Mexico, right. they yeah. all went off. Yeah. So if one little power company can do that, what's going to happen if 10% of them fail? Yeah. It's nice to consider. <laughs> and, I'm not even pre- and I'm not even prepared, uh, Art. You know, I have a few cans of spaghetti. We have a couple of books of matches, and you know, we feel we're going to be okay. But, uh, um, I, I, you know, I'm along for the ride, and uh, if I die, hey, it's okay with me, as long as things get really messed up. Uh, I just like the idea that... that uh, that I can turn, well, maybe I can't turn on the news. I guess I got one of those wind-up radios you have. Yeah. And I can listen to that, and I can hear how bad it is. I, mean, were... I don't care, Art. You see, I'm, I'm just a person who doesn't care about these things. I, I really don't care. I know that when things, like an earthquake, like I say, when the, when the amusement park ride is out of your control, yeah. you have to just hold on and enjoy the ride. And I know that that is a possibility. Uh, as you say, between now and the spring, I'm just I'm just hoping that a lot of overseas, a lot of a lot of other countries get really chaotic. They're going to get hammered. Yeah, I, I I had a guy who called me who said that he's looking around at everything that's happening on Earth right now, environmentally and every other way you can imagine, socially, of the kids killing kids, all the rest of it, and he's saying, uh, you know, Mother Earth is mad, and and she's uh, she's going to do something, and I said no. She, Mother Earth doesn't get mad; she gets even, and that's that's what I think. I think if things get out of balance, yes. that there'll be a return to balance, and that return to balance might mean a twenty-five. Yeah, right. Yeah, but like you know, as you say, a twenty-five, and we don't get to enjoy it. Maybe something like a twelve, <laughs> where we can enjoy it. Well, I just wrote out a seven here a few weeks ago, and I don't care to do that at all. It was horrible. How far, is Perump, the hell out of me. how far is Pahrump from Las Vegas? I 65 know miles oh, west. I didn't realize it was that far. I can, look, I can look to the east, and the entire sky is lit up with the glow of all the lights from Las Vegas. Ah, uh, yeah, the light dome. Yep. Well, I'm over here under the light dome, Art. And I can see Jupiter. At least I can see Jupiter. That's my favorite uh, object in the sky. Well, you get 65 miles away from that city. And you will see stars. You'll see the Milky Way from oh, yeah. one side all the way to the other side of the horizon. Well, I drive home from here every time I leave here, and I leave here four or five times a, a year, and I drive uh, back to Los Angeles, and I always stop a couple of times out in the middle of everywhere and uh, and take a good look. I do know about, uh, about the, the names of about 65 stars. Uh, I, I have to be up to snuff on them. Sometimes I get a little rusty and I probably drop down to 40 or so. But I love the sky. I love, I call it my backyard. I think of it as, uh, as something unchanging that I can find it from Cleveland. I can find it from Manila. And, uh, and it's regular and predictable. And I know my stars and I know my constellations. So I love it. And I know what you mean when you refer to that Milky Way. Have you ever seen anything in that great sky that you cannot explain? No, you know, I'm a little disappointed in in, the, in what we'll call the, the world of the paranormal or, or the extra normal or whatever is a proper way to phrase it. Um, I kind of root for and I wish for uh, a sighting, a visitation, an experience uh, of, a, of, a, of a ghost or an afterlife or a previous life or something. Mm. I've never had any of them. I have a fairly good intellect and I'm very open to these things. Uh, I have my skepticism. I have that part. I do respect science and, and uh, you know, repeatable scientific experiments. Are you really open to these things, though, or well, are, or are you more of a control freak? Um, I have to, I'd have to say I, I don't know the answer to that. In other words, if something happened, are you more likely to mentally reject it or embrace it? Oh no, I would be open to it. I, at least that's my opinion as standing here now. Uh, I can't tell you what would happen under a given circumstance, but my feeling is that my knowledge of myself is such that I feel I would be, I would say, oh, please, look, come on down here, let's talk. Can I have a shirt like that? Let me have one of those funny hats. I mean, I'm being a little flip here, but I, I know that I am open and, and willing to experience some of this because I think there is, there is so much unexplained and so much potential beyond this limited human experience and this spectrum that we can perceive, this limited visual pers- uh, spectrum and, uh, and audio pr- uh, spectrum that we 
that we perceive. I think there's just much more, and I, I wish my radar were better. Do you think that it's more likely that we are a product of the God of the Bible we talked about earlier, or perhaps intervention by others? Well, I think, I think very strongly that that, that, is, uh, that is the probability. I think there's a leap, and, and I'm not up to this... Uh, I'm not up on this as much as I was at one time when my reading was a little more intense, uh, but I think there's a gap, there's a leap in human um, uh, intellectual attainment that is unexplained. And I do believe it is probable that we are a hybrid of some kind. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the book, the, the uh, Sitkin, Sitkin's book of the 12th planet. Sitkin, yes. Yeah, I found that very, um, very... Uh, stimulating and, and potentially believable. Well, he postulates we were all a bunch of gold diggers. Yes, that's right. And uh, that that uh, that planet will come back, and yeah. you have to wonder what those who created with us would. I mean, look at California, for example. Um, now, this may be a little lighthearted, but when I was young, it was the coolest thing to go to California, and I did. I got up and I left, and I went to California, mm. and it was great. Today, when I go to California, I am appalled. I am absolutely appalled. I mean, what has happened to that golden state, that yes. once great place to go to? It is regulated to death, taxed to death. It's a disaster. It's a social disaster. I mean, y y you can go and spend a little time in a lot of cities in California, and you can count the muzzle flashes, you know. Yes, and, and it's just ugly. It's ugly to the eye, from the air, from the ground. Uh, there are too many humans uh, to begin with everywhere. There are certainly too many of them packed into the population centers of California. I live in Southern California. The one thing I can say that I have good about my existence there is I live in Venice, down on those little canals, and I uh, hear the ducks every night or hey. in the, the middle of the morning, and at least I'm close to the ocean, and I'm a little bit away from the sound of traffic. And, and it's, it's like a small oasis, but I agree with you, and, and I think it's true of most everywhere. Too many people, too much acquisition of goods, too many people hunting uh, money and position and possessions. Everyone wants a salad shooter. Everyone wants a pair of sneakers with lights in them. Everyone wants a, a, a shirt with the number of some foolish basketball player on the back of it. And, and we've been bought off. We've been bought off with all these gadgets and toys. Uh, but it, two things I think that happened to this species that are irreversible and that destroyed us are the belief in a man in the sky, that's the sky god, as Gore Vidal calls him, yeah. the belief in the sky god who, who keeps a scorecard on us and has a, a burning pit of uh, hell for some of us, and the other is the pursuit of goods, commerce, rampant consumerism. The next HBO show I do is called uh, the Great American Cattle Drive. But the American cattle are not being prepared for market in order to be sold. They're, they're there for buying. They're there to do the buying. Get them to the mall. Get these suckers to the mall. Put them on the Internet. Get them buying from e-commerce. Get them in the mall. It's just, it's just repulsive and disgusting, and it's one of the reasons I quit this species. It's one of the reasons I backed off and said, wait a minute, that's you over there, folks. This is me over here. I'll go my way, and if it costs me something, fine. I'll pay whatever price it is. Well, you're rich. I mean, you could quit now and never work another day in your life, right? Well, there's a, uh, there's a caveat there. Uh, oh, really? Well, I, I spent 20 years with the IRS trying to recover from a bad uh, old tax bill that I had really? uh, that got worse and worse with penalties and interest and a little bit worse at the beginning of this uh, cycle uh, with uh, adding. They, they disallowed a few other things that I had uh, that I had uh, tried to claim, uh, which weren't horrendously, you know, they weren't really out of line. They were, uh, they were invested. Millions and millions, huh? But they were, they were sufficient that <laughs> with penalties and interest, uh, I had a lien on my house for 20 years until I sold it about, uh, about six months ago and, uh, and paid them off, and that's finally over. So I, have, I earn well. See, I've always had good earning power. I've been blessed with the ability... Uh, but the energy, I had a few heart attacks along the way, but that's the only thing. I've had energy and creativity, and I've grown in my art so that I can earn well, and I can continue to earn now, and I can save a little and keep a little of this money now. But I'm not sitting on a big pile somewhere. I, I so you're a, telling me you really couldn't quit right now? 
Well, I could quit, but I wouldn't live the way I do now. Uh, it'll take me another two or three years, maybe, or five years to uh, to do that, you know, and say, okay, everything's working for me. Well, that's, that's, cons that's, that's consumerism, George. Oh, George, hold on. Okay. We'll be right back. This, this should fit right in. you got to listen to the words here, folks. Bigger and bigger ones. Don't go around tonight, but take your life. Bad moon on the right. I hear are I know the end is coming soon. In the Kingdom of Nye, from west of the Rockies, dial 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. Or use the wild card line at 1-775-727-1295. To reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the Premier Radio Network. Indeed so. George Carlin is here, and he'll be right back. So we'll, uh, we'll get right to it. Now, here is, I'm sure, something positive we can talk about, George. All right. Now, somebody sends a fax, and they're, they're really right. They say even the most cynical person uh, frequently, and, and you're in that position now, would would have some words to say about love. I mean, you're obviously you're newly in love, yes. and you're you're plunging, tumbling right into it again, and so you must feel pretty positive about that. Well, uh, the the only things that I really believe in, because I don't believe in my country, I don't believe in religion and God and the institutions that man has made. I don't believe in commerce, but I believe in in friendship, romantic love. Uh, and, and, and family, of course, which, which is bound into sure. friendship. Uh, yes, I, I believe heartily, and that, that goes back to the, my affection for individual existence and individuals and, and the life of the, the soul person. Um, it's, it's, as I say, when they begin to, when they get into, get into numbers larger than four or five, even, even sometimes a, a, a group of two, yeah. will alter how a person is. Uh, you know, you heard a, a woman will say, well, Mike's not the same when he's with those guys. Or the guys will say, well, he, now that he's got married, he's a different guy. Right. People surrender something. Uh, it, that's why when, when a good love affair comes along, when a great love happens, it's because the, the two people don't have to surrender too much of themselves to make a new unit. And, and that's what I'm lucky enough to think I have found. And I agree with that fact, Sender. All right. Now, uh, on another subject, you were railing about consumerism, and you said you've got somehow coming, coming up on that soon. Right. And yet, and, and you were talking about beautiful Venice, but Venice, California, yeah. it, it's in California, and Venice is the very center of glitz, glamour, and consumerism. I mean, the very center in the world, if you had to pick a place other than maybe where you are right now. You mean, you mean Venice, California, in, in Los Angeles? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, Los Angeles generally. Well, okay, fine. Now, that I agree to. I agree with. Um, let, me, let me point something out, and this might take me a minute or two. All right. Um, I have often confronted it. Well, originally I confronted it for myself, but I've been confronted with the idea of uh, 
when, you know, when does one sell out? When have you uh, sold out? And, yeah. and I have a problem with people who try to make that a black or white issue. To me, uh, the idea of uh, compromise or adjustment is, is on a scale. It's on a continuum. Uh, the most, the purest person in the world would have to live in the woods and eat bark and make his own clothing to be truly pure. That's I mean, right. even Ted Kaczynski, who hated technology, used a typewriter to type his manifesto. Absolutely. And he, and he rode buses, the interstate bus system, to go to a post office to mail, the United States government, to mail his bombs, which were also a form of crude technology. Mm. And certainly no one would say, well, Ted's a sellout. So these things exist on a scale, a sliding scale, and, and each person must decide how much of an adjustment or compromise, if you will, they are going to make in order to do the thing that's important to them, in order to, con to, to continue to be the person they, they want to be. And I have to sell tickets. I have to sell CDs. I have to be in the commercial world. I talked about my IRS a problem. That's only because I earned big. So I'm not pure. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't uh, say that that's my scene. My scene is that I try to to keep as much of my of my values intact as I can and still exist in this world and not be some sort of a martyr when everyone else is running around taking care of themselves. Did you read? Did you ever read Kaczynski's manifesto? No, I, I started to, and uh, he actually had a lot of good points. Well, of course. You know, well, I happen to admire people like that, to tell you the truth. I know that the taking of human life to some people is not a good thing, but I don't think we've made human life very, uh, very valuable in this uh, in this culture we've we've evolved. And I think uh, I think there's a place for people who decide to take lives uh, in order to make a point. I, well, I, well, there's a lot of that going on. I, I, there was a guy on TV, and I can't remember the special I saw, but it was a, you know, one of these L.A. gang members. And he looked right into the screen, and he said, I don't give a damn whether I live or die. Yeah. So you can imagine how I feel about you. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's very, very true. I mean, this culture has uh, degraded all of us to some degree or another, and all you can try to do is to cling to some little portions of yourself, and I mean self with almost like with a capital S, uh, that, are, that are important and that define you uh, and, and let the rest just fly. That's why I take pleasure in the disasters and in the troubles. <laughs> and, and, and let me say something about this, about the millennium thing, uh, the, the Y2K and, and what you spoke so, uh, so directly to before. I think it's kind of wonderful that the arrogance of this species is what will bring it down. If it goes as badly as you say, and if it really uh, sends us back uh, several decades or centuries or whatever to some level of barbarism, I think it's kind of interesting and ironic and poetic and literary that the fact that we have this uh, admiration for triple zero, Mm. for round numbers, and for a false calculation to start with. Never mind that we're a year off because people are so ignorant that they think the millennium begins with the two and not, uh, not ends with the zero. Calculation to start with. Never mind that we're a year off because people are so ignorant that they think the millennium begins with the two and not, uh, not ends with the zero. All right. um, but, but beyond that, this is all because... Uh, a, a monk, as you know, and you're aware of all of this, uh, Dionysius, the, Dennis the Short was mm -hmm. his name. In, uh, I think, the seventh, let me see, I, I have notes on this here, and let me get it exactly right. Um, what happened was, Dennis the Small, or Dennis the Little, Dionysius Exigu Exiguous, Exiguous, Dionysius the Short, he was commissioned by Pope John I in 525. He was a 6th century Scythian monk. He was told to standardize the liturgical calendar, and he did not include a year zero between 1 B.C. and 1 A.D. So on December 31st, huh. it's, you know, we're welcoming in the last year of the preceding thousand years, not the new millennium. That's the obvious part. But on top of that, uh, there is confusion about when Christ was born, because this is all based on one figure, his birth date, and, uh, and uh, Luke places the birth of Jesus while Quirinius was governor of Syria, which included Judea. But historians know that Quirinius was not appointed governor until A.D. 6 or A.D. 7. 
So they don't know if they're four years off, six years off, seven years off. It's all a miscalculation, and if it really destroys civilization, it's a wonderful thing that an arrogant <laughs> species can bring itself low by its own calculations. Uh, and even though it's wrong. Hubris. <laughs> Hubris. <laughs> yeah, that would be something. And, uh, and I think we're fully capable of it. Oh, actually. yeah. So, uh, so, listen, censorship. Yeah. When you first started your career... I think the first album you had had some kind of warning label on it. Uh, this record contains seven words you can never say on television or radio, whatever it was. Right. Anyway, is there anything left today? Is there any censorship left today? Do you deal with that when you go on HBO? Are there things that they say, oh, no. really? No. I, first of all, I, I own all of my own record albums and masters. I have made 18 records. I own them all, and I own all my 12 HBO shows. I've had a very good, uh, solid career that's sustained very well, and I own all of these things. Uh, I am an independent contractor, and I make a, a show. HBO gives me a little advance, or it's not so little, actually, and I make a show, and when I deliver that show, they give me the rest of the money, you know, my profit. Sure. And uh, it's, it's a licensing thing, and then I, they run it for 18 times if they want, and, and then I keep it. But they never say a word? I have not since 1977, when I began with them 12 shows ago. They have never said a word to me, and I swear to you that's the truth. And that's one of the things that saved me. I had an album career, and by the way, before I get off tonight, Art, I do want to plug my CD box set, and I'll tell you about that later. All right. But I had an album career in the 70s where I had six albums. And four of them went gold. You referred to one of them, uh, the uh, Class Clown album. Yep. had the seven words you can never say on TV. Right. The next album after that, Occupation Fool, had a, had a, a sequel called uh, Filthy Words. And that's the one that went to the Supreme Court. I'm the only comedian who ever had one of his routines as the subject of a Supreme Court case. Mm -hmm. And in 1978, they decided five to four that those seven words I said were... Uh, indecent. It wasn't an obscenity case, but it was called, they, they created a whole new category of filth just for me. And uh, I was kind of, I, mean, I am perversely proud of that. I'm a footnote in American legal history. But uh, I then, when my album career kind of, you know, you can't be the hot new guy in town forever. forever. That's right. So that, that kind of faded in 76, 77, and along came HBO, and I had another medium, such as albums are, where I was uninterrupted by commercials and I was uncensored uh, by someone looking over my shoulder. Uh, on an album, you put out whatever you want, and on an HBO show, I do whatever I want. And that took my career, which was in the middle of a crossroads, and, and really pushed it to a high status. And, and I've done 12 of those shows. I average one every... I'm sorry, I've done 11. I keep thinking about the next one. But I've done 11 of them, and in 22 years now, I've done 11, and that's every two years. How did you feel about the cross from doing albums uh, to television? That's a big jump. Well, all during my album career, and before that, when I had an earlier uh, surge of popularity as a straight kind of a stand-up, you know, suit and tie, short hair, I had a wonderful career in the 60s of being what you'd call a mainstream comedian, I did all the big variety shows. I did 25 Merv Griffins and about 30 Mike Douglases and 11 uh, Ed Sullivans. So I had a career before my hair got long and I got more personal with my comedy. Uh, but I, I always did television. And all, all I ever wanted from TV, there are two ways I do television. One is to go on Letterman or go on the Leno show. And in exchange for my coming on, just like any movie star or any you know, kind of a actress or a band leader, um, I, I come on and I give them a little marquee value and they give me a chance to plug whatever I'm plugging. So that's one way of doing television. And in those cases, I don't try to change their rules. I'm not there to be controversial. I'm, I'm there for a commercial bargain on striking. So you, you save the controversy for the albums or the HBOs? Yeah, I, HBO is my real art. You know, and I refer to it as art, even though that's your first name, Art. <laughs> uh, I, I know it sounds pretentious sometimes for a comedian to, to, to use the word art. It is entertainment first, but there's an artistic process on. It's a writing job, and, and you are interpreting the world through your own prism. So that's an artistic process. And, and uh, I go to HBO just to show pictures of what I do. It's really essentially nothing but my theater act shown in your home, uh, the same way a baseball game is. The baseball game it's, it happens in the, in the stadium, but they show them at home and unchanged. 
That's what I do for HBO. Do people write stuff for you, or do never, you write? Never, never, forty years. All I've your own had, stuff. Only time I ever had anything written was when I would uh, be on a, a variety show in the '60s, and they would write a sketch that I was in. Anything I ever uttered as my own has always been written by me. That's my pride. Oh yeah. That I that I've written everything, and that I don't need help. This is a this is a self-contained unit. Do you ever wonder? And I ask uh, a lot of famous people about this, uh, be, because Ted Turner once said on a Pinnacle show, I, I saw uh -huh. him, and he said, you know, having all this money, having everything, uh, the CNN, the whole thing that I've got, he said, at the end of the day, it's all kind of an empty bag. That's what he said. It's kind of an empty bag. He's got so much money, so much of everything, it doesn't mean much to him anymore. It's an empty bag. Well, that sounds as if, as if he doesn't get much joy from the process. No. That he's in. Right. I, I, I'm assuming he didn't think to, to mention that part. Um, no, I I consider myself lucky and uh, privileged to have been able to use my natural gifts in a way that uh, satisfied me without you know, but, but doing it all on my own terms and being rewarded for it, not just with money, but with this you know. Oh, that's the positive thing I was going to say a long time back. <laughs> Here's what it is. Yes. I get to have, even though I was a kind of a lonesome kid, and I love my lonership, and I love being alone in the world, and Sally and I love being a little small unit separated from the rest. But you know something? When I go into an airport or a restaurant or a right. hotel lobby, right. I have people who say nice things to me, who say, I saw you in 1971, I saw you in 1965. <laughs> oh, my sister used to, she loved you, she, she passed away last year, and she just had your book next to her. All of these strange stories about how you uh, touched people's lives. And I think of it as an extended family for whom I don't have to buy Christmas gifts. <laughs> they like me. I like them one at a time as I meet them. But, but it's a wonderful gift to have. And, and, and it's, it's part of that paradox. Like I say, the, uh, the cynic is really a, a disappointed idealist. Well, the loner is longing to belong to something. Somewhere in him there's the need to belong and be accepted, at least in my case. And I get a little of that. I get a lot of it. But kind of afraid to at the same time, right? Yes, that's right. I don't want to be ruled by the other, but I like knowing that I've touched them and that they care about me. If we could have a one world something or another yeah. that would be... You know, kind of like this country. Workable that, and viable. That, yeah, yeah, that'd be all right. But I, I, you, yeah. you've, you've done a lot of travel. You've been to Russia, I bet. Right. You've been to China. I've been to both those places fairly recently. Yeah. And let me tell you, oh, yeah. they'd have shot you a long time ago. Listen, this is the best thing we've come up with. I admit that. Uh, it's a grudging admittance because I like having my little attitudes, you know. But I'm not <laughs> dishonest. And uh, this is the best we've done, the best we've come up with. I just wish that that the, the ability to refine it and to make it better were more viable, were more uh, available to us. It, it seems as though there are a lot of, and, and a lot of it is that money, that, that political yep. money, yep. The, the interests that control things, and that's the way it is. You know, when they talk about conspiracies, and, and one of the things I, I enjoy on your show is when people talk about uh, the government, and, and I'm talking about your guests who talk about, whether or not the government and certain agencies and certain aspects of government have, have covered things up. And I always, I have thought for a long time, not always obviously, but that, um, you know, they tried to, to make it so that the belief in the conspiracy is, makes you somehow outside uh, the norm, that, that you're a kook, that you're a conspiracy buff. They say he's a conspiracy buff. George, they lie their asses off. I know it. And, and he, let, I wrote a little something out, and I want to read it to you, because I pulled this paper up from the other room. I have some notes I haven't filed yet. And I said, well, if this comes up, I'd like to be able to say this to Art. So let me just read this to you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and it goes like this. Do I believe in conspiracies? Nah. Do I believe powerful people would get together and plan for certain outcomes? Nah. Do I believe powerful interests would operate outside the law and maybe even kill people? Nah. Do I believe secret government agencies might feel the need to assassinate a person and cover it up? Nah. I think everything in America is open and clean and above board, and powerful people always play by the rules. And I'll... Uh, that's my thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, you should have been on my government agent line. Oh. I had a government agent line open earlier. Really? Yeah. I, you know, the, my biggest sadness is that I, I do go to sleep. Uh, not my biggest sadness. Listen to this hyperbole. God, I got to slap myself. <laughs> 
One of my um, disappointments is that I don't get to hear you every night all the way through, um, and that I don't get to hear you every night. I do go to sleep a little bit early. Uh, down here in Las Vegas, I do go to sleep late, but I'm usually writing at night and working on my computer. Okay, then listen to me. Tomorrow night, I don't, I don't have, have you ever heard of Ed Dames? Uh, you he's, know, a, he's a remote viewer. You know, we spent twenty million dollars on a remote viewing program in the government. He was part of him that. on before. Uh, you? That's right. They yeah, call him. Know. They call him Doctor Doom. Okay. And that's for good reason, because uh, well, I'll tell you why. Hold on, we'll do a plug for you when we get back and do a final segment here. You promised me two hours, and we're certainly well into that. George Carlin is my guest. We'll be right back. That's right. Tomorrow night, by the way, Ed Dames will be here. Doctor Doom. And they are always wild programs. So if you're into pending disaster, you're going to want to be here tomorrow night. Believe me. describes that short guy George was talking about a little while ago. Call Art Bell in the Kingdom of Nye from west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. And the wild card line is open at 1-775-727-1295. To reach out on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nine. And right now, George Carlin is my guest. He'll be back in a moment, and we're going to uh, we're going to do the big payoff here, the plug. So you don't want to miss that. <laughs> Stay right where you are. All right, here we go again. And, George, I know you do have something coming out, something new, something people can get soon. What is it? Yeah, and by the way, this makes a wonderful First Communion gift. Oh? Yes. <laughs> now, this is, this is the box set. The albums I talked about earlier from the 1970s, we took all six of them and put them in a CD box set. Oh, my God. And not many comedians have a box set, I'm happy to say. Uh... This is all six albums from the 70s, plus a bonus album. You've got to have a bonus art. Sure. got to have a free extra added complimentary bonus gift <laughs> album for no cost to you. This is 70 minutes of things no one has ever heard of mine. So it's like a new album within the box set. Oh, my. Uh, all stuff from that era that didn't make uh, the albums then, because at that time, the LPs only accommodated about 45 minutes of spoken word. That's right. So we always had some things I had to leave out, and it always bothered me, but I've taken them all, put them together, put them in the bonus CD, and here's the really interesting part, because, you know, a box set is a, is a fan's purchase. This is not a general consumer item. People don't go spend 80 bucks on a comedian's box set, but if they're fans, if they're really crazed, uh, they care about these things. And in this uh, bonus CD on it are um, some recordings I made as a child uh, before tape recorders were very common. In fact, they were only sold in, in showrooms at the time, not even in consumer stores. Uh, I was lucky enough, my mother bought me a tape recorder when I graduated from grammar school in 1951. But it was as big as a Buick art. So you were how old? I was at uh, that time uh, 14, just had just turned 14. So this is material from when you were 14? It's before that. It's when I was 12 because uh, before uh, I had my tape recorder, uh, I had to go to those little booths. Remember those little booths? Uh, yep. In the arcade, you put in a quarter, and for a minute they'd record your voice, and they'd give you a little acetate record. That's right. I re- uh, oh, yes, I remember. Well, I, had, I made eight of them when I was about 12 years old, and I've, I've, got, I've kept them all these years, and we put them on this CD, 
and it's got my, you know, it's, it's just like hearing a, a prototype of what I wound up doing later. It's all these little routines and comedy impressions and newscasts and sports things. And, and you can hear my old New York accent. I say, good evening, this is George Carlin with the news. <laughs> and it's, it's, it warms my heart. And I think a fan would might be interested in it. There are, there are six of those little records on there. Oh, that's neat. Uh, yeah, and so the album, it, it's just my box set. They, you know, they don't have to know the name of it. It happens to be called The Little David Years. But asking for it by my name is enough. And I, I just want people who care, my, care about my stuff, because I know those fans exist. Uh, to have access to this. And like I say, a wonderful First Communion gift. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, so these are available like in record stores. Yeah, or is there an 800 number or something? No, they're, they're available. Atlantic Records has been my distributor forever. My, my label is called Eardrum, but I'm, a, I'm distributed by Atlantic Records, and this is in all the stores. All right. So it's there now. Yes, it Already is. there now. Yeah. That's quite a project. Uh, so really, you always knew, or you were always who you are now. You're just sort of a progression of what you were. That's right. When I was 11 years old in fifth grade, they uh, they said, we, we wrote little autobiographies. I think 11 is a good year for that. Um, and, and the last page was, what do you want to be? You know, what about your future? And I, I still know mine. I still have it, actually. I have the little piece of paper. It says, uh, I want to be an actor, comedian, impersonator, disc jockey, radio announcer, or trumpet player. <laughs> I always knew what I wanted, and I planned... I planned my life when I was about 14 or 15. I planned uh, how I would go about it. I'd become a disc jockey, and then that would get me into comedy. Is that what you did? Uh, uh, you mean did I follow the, the, the plan? Yeah, in other words, did you become a disc jockey? Yes, I, I got into uh, disc jockeying when I was 19. I was in the, the Air Force down in Shreveport, Louisiana. I was on the number one station in the nine-station market. I had a 52 share, Art. 52 share? A 52 share in a nine-station market. That's, that's really incredible. And I was 19 years old. It was a daytime station, 1,000 watts. It was called KJOE, KJO in Shreveport. And being a daytime station, we had to get our listeners back again every morning, you know. <laughs> they wander away at night. That's right. So it was a good station, and I had a very lucky childhood. I got to plan my own life and live it out, and I, I consider myself a very lucky man. And I've worked hard for it, too, but that's genetic. You know, working hard is not something you... you you decide it's something that comes to you because you kind of feel like you ought to do it. I, I always knew too exactly what I was going to do, radio all the way, and it's oh, been that good. all my life. And but but there are so many people out there who are, I don't know, they're they're they have no idea what they want to do. Yeah. You, you talk to the kids and I don't know. Well, they don't have an overriding um, interest or an overriding talent or an overriding goal or art form that, you know, kind of drives them, something that takes over. I was going to say drive. Oh, yeah, something that takes you over and says, this is it, buddy. It actually, it, it, it's almost like it's, it's a drive that's almost more than drive. It's a madness almost. <laughs> yeah, I think, it's, I think it has a lot to do with genetics. I mean, I honestly think... Uh, they're finding out, of course, the more they, they map this human genome and start to isolate some of these genes. And some of it's oversimplified, I know. But uh, I think they're finding, and I've always said, that uh, it's mostly genetic. There's a good amount of uh, environmental. I mean, there's a lot of nurture. But, boy, nature is really in charge. How, how old do you say you were? 60? I'm now 62. I'll be 63 62. in May. You know, I have the world's experts at longevity on the program, doctors, uh -huh. and they are telling me, honestly, if you can hang on for another 30 years, yes. there's every probability we can give you immortality. Well, I, I know about some of those projections. I don't know them as, you know, in such a detailed fashion as I'm sure you do. But uh, it's you're, you're kind of on the edge here. It's funny that you say 30 <laughs> years because I have predicted for myself to live to 94 Really? Yes, I've always said that's my goal. And I know that the brain, I learned something as a teenager, that the brain, I read a book called Cyber, uh, God, now I can't think of the name of it. <laughs> Isn't that great? Doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, Psycho-Cybernetics. And, and it said that the brain is a goal-seeking, problem-solving mechanism. And if you put in a problem and a goal, the brain will do everything it can to get there. Mm -hmm. So I put 94 years in there once because my uncle or great-uncle, Uncle Martin, used to, he was 94, and he was doing push-ups in my kitchen when I was a kid. And I said, 94 sounds good. And I know the kind of work that people like Linus Pauling and Philip Johnson and, and, right. and a number of other people have done in their 90s. And as long as I have my faculties, I expect 
to have this kind of energy and drive and stamina until then. And boy, it'd be nice if they came and give me that immortality. Yeah, but they really aren't. They're not just talking about immortality. They're talking about taking you back to your prime and stopping the aging process. Wow. Well, let, let I don't me, know if that'd be good, actually. Well, I know, but you know what? It'd be worth an experiment. Well, it, 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 if you were one of the ones, they could be alternative. <laughs> Right? <laughs> That's right. Boom. All right, look, I, I do have a radio show. Um, can I put a couple of callers on with you? Oh, I'd love that. And by the way, I have a website called georgecarlin.com. It's a really nice, well-engineered website. And, and again, I'm, I speak mostly to fans. I'm not trying to sell myself to the general public. I have a nice little percentage of the population that likes me. And I want them to know I have a great website called georgecarlin.com. Well, if we don't have a link, we will within minutes. Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with George Carlin. Hello. Yeah, hello, George. How are you? I have two questions, if I may. What's where, your name, sir? Where, where am I? Uh, Los Angeles? No, I mean your name, sir. Oh, Zan. Zan. Short for Alexander. Okay, Zan. Nice sometimes to talk to Sometimes I say it's an old Martian name, but... It doesn't sound bad to me. Huh. Yeah, well, the question is, have you read... Uh, I know you're talking about we being a product of some accident. Have you read books by, like, uh, Darwin's Black Book black box by a biologist who believes that that idea of random evolution is not scientifically uh, viable? You mean the combination of uh, punctuated equilibrium and, and natural selection is not viable, the, the whole Darwinian combination? Yeah. Well, yeah, the idea yeah. of the, the process of it being accidental. Oh, you know, well, I, no, sir, obviously I haven't read it, and I, I, I admit to being poorly read. I'm, I'm usually wasting my time writing rather than reading. But I will have a tape of this show, and I will have a reference. I can write it down uh, at another time and, and look for it. I, I do enjoy that sort of reading. Well, he just wanted to sort of infect you with the possibility that it's not all random, that there really is the God that you talk about that isn't there. And, but is he judgmental? Well, we didn't get that far with him. Oh, but okay. I, I, I would say there would be a strong possibility of it, yes. Yeah, I mean, you just implied. So Zan is gone already. <laughs> okay. Wild Card Line, you're on the air with George Carlin and Art Bell. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Good morning to both of you guys. Hi. Yeah. Where, where are you, sir? I am in Michigan, and my name is Joe. Hi, Joe. Uh, how are you doing? Pretty good. Yeah, I figured I'd call in and ask you what you thought about all the, basically the horrors in uh, U.S. history, uh, Blue laws, uh, everything that restricts personal liberty, the government killing people, uh, basically the, the bad side of U.S. history that's never really exposed to a great deal to the mass public. Well, um, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying, in, in, and my own knowledge of it goes so far as maybe to have read some Howard Zinn and to, uh, to have read some of that part of history. Um, I've often said when they talk about, you know, they... There are people who say that we've had a loss of civility in this country, mm. that there's been this breakdown in manners and civility. And I say, well, what civility would that be? Would that be the genocide of the Indians? Would that be slavery? Would that be the Hiroshima or the Nagasaki civility? Which civility do we mean? Uh, I think uh, this country has a lot to answer for, a lot to answer for. Tuskegee. Pardon me? Pardon me? Tuskegee. Uh, yes, well, you can, you can go on and on. Uh, uh, Hazel O'Leary, uh, our own energy secretary, walking out incredibly just a couple of years ago and saying we fed plutonium to kids and pregnant women and stuff I like know that. It. Oh, and, and these stories are legion. I mean, they're, they're, the list is getting longer and longer. And if you just think about the labor violence in the 1930s, you know, in the name of, of uh, commerce, in the name of big business, it is a terrible blotted record and I have always said when people revere the flag I've always said you have to uh, look at that flag for everything it stands for not just what you perceive to be heroic and, and perhaps good things but everything it's ever stood for and the record is more than just mixed well yeah it is and uh, you know it I remember when I was young and uh, I'm not that that much younger than you are I remember when the Federal Bureau of Investigation would come out, they'd come on television, it would be like, we've caught so-and-so. It was like the word of gold. I mean, oh, yeah. if the FBI came on, man, you believed every word they said. Today, if the FBI says something, you almost automatically disbelieve it. Absolutely. I think, and I think it is a good thing. There are people who decry this, you know, that, uh, that this um, 
this loss of uh, trust in our, yeah. in our leaders, in our government. In our, well, well, the record is there, and I think it's a good thing. And if, it, and if it's going to require some bloodshed someday to get it right, because I honestly believe, you know what I like about assassination art? It shoots the <laughs> hell out of those popularity polls. Those polls, he's up to 70% now. All of a sudden, bing, he's not even in the poll anymore. And I'm not telling people to go out and do that, but I'm telling you, when Good. I see that, and, and we're way behind India even. India has killed three Gandhis, and we've only killed two Kennedys. Israel's been busy? Oh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to me. I just love that, that punctuation in history when it happens. <laughs> Well, they warned me. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with George Carlin. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Hi, who have I got here? Who do you suppose? Or well, I don't know. Well, who are you calling? No, I'm George. Oh, no, I meant the caller. Oh, the caller is gone. Uh, we oh, somehow yeah. lost the caller. That's too Somebody bad. Somebody just picked him off. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> west of the Rockies, you're on the air with George Carlin and Art Bell. Uh, yeah, hello. Hello. Hi there. Uh, I'm calling from uh, L.A., uh, Mac. Hi, Mac. How are you doing? I'm George. Old Yuppieville suburb. Uh, but the comment I had was uh, it's kind of weird the way uh, humans uh, think with the, uh, you know, profanity and everything. It doesn't really make any sense. Like uh, a teacher I had one time brought up a good point. Like if you uh, switch the words uh, crap and red, then it'd be perfectly fine to. Uh, Say yeah, could you hand me that crap pen? But you say, oh uh, yeah, I really got to take a red. The teacher yells at you. <laughs> right, that's right. Yes, that is right. Well, um, the, thing, the thing about words is that they're they're arbitrary designations, and they freeze meaning. Uh, they don't allow for nuance or any sort of spectrum, and uh, that's one of the difficulties and limitations of language. And then when you add religious superstition and fear guilt and shame of the human body. This is what religion has done to us in this area of obscenity. It has taken the human body, its functions concerning sex, and, and, and as it happens, excretory uh, procedures, and, and assigned to it an evil, a bad um, attitude. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not being too articulate about yes, this. Yes, you are. I'm trying to rush. Uh, but, but it has to do with superstition. Uh, it is not a reality. The two most un compromising forces in human experience are going to the bathroom and having sex. Yep. And these are the two things that are obscene. Not the taking of human life, but, but these two things are considered obscene, and, and these are the most irrepressible forces in nature. That's what Howard Stern gets in trouble for. Well, Howard... Talk about that stuff. Yeah, I, I know, but he does it, you know, he, he's, he's kinda, he has to be kind of cute. <laughs> Show us your breath. <laughs> That's true. Uh, that's true. He's on radio, and, you know, he got in a lot of trouble. I mean, a lot of stations he was on got fined, and yeah. he went through hell. Well, Kind of you know, like my, you. My case was the one that established that. Those seven dirty words became a Supreme Court case because a, a radio station played my record on the air in 1973. And in 78, the Supreme Court decided five to four these words were indecent when played on the radio. Did the radio station keep its license? It was, uh, yes, it did. Uh, it did. It was WBAI. It was not a commercial station. It was a listener-supported station. Ah, and they kept their license. So they kept their license. Yeah, that really is a big victory, actually. Yeah, and, and it's funny. They'll just carve. See, they'll just define it any way they want to get what they need, what they think they need. But it's so absurd. I mean, I just read Newsweek, and it's got a story about John McCain. And it says how he said, F blank, 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 Y blank, blank, blank. Mm. Now, there it is in plain black and white. They didn't say the two words, but it's clear what they meant, and every reader was intended to know what they meant. Of course. So apparently, knowing what he said wouldn't hurt you or corrupt you morally. But, but actually hearing it. But to print the actual letters would mm. somehow violate something. This is how, mm. how simple-minded and how thin this philosophy is. Of, of censoring, and other places probably wouldn't say the bl F blank, blank, blank. They just say blank or expletive. And, and there's no real standard for this. It's all haphazard, and it's all based on religious fear, guilt, and superstition. In the general media, is that ever going to change? In our lifetimes, maybe that's a better question, is that ever going to change? Is, is the world going to just open up? Well, there is erosion. Uh, I mean, Newsweek would not have even put that much in there 10 years ago, or certainly 20 years ago. So there's a certain erosion that takes place. But, um, no, I, I can tell you an eight, uh, a 10-letter and a 12-letter one that they'll never print unless 
it's a magazine with a smaller circulation that doesn't <laughs> depend so much on mass advertising. It all has to do with money. earning the buck. Yeah. Money, money, money. Yeah, not offending a, a buyer. Well, you're very good at behaving yourself, aren't you? In other words, you, you can either be George, the HBO George, or the record album George, or you can be the George under control, yeah. e even doing stuff for kids. You do some stuff. Well, for I, kids did a, I did a show on H. Uh, I'm sorry, on PBS. Uh, I did 45 episodes. I followed. Uh, I took the place of Ringo Starr. Uh, in that respect, I'm kind of the anti Pete Best. <laughs> a very inside rock joke. I'm the anti Pete Best. But I, I, I played a character called Mr. Conductor, and uh, it was a sweet, sweet, well produced and well written children's show. It was not. Um, a, a kind of a garbage show, and I took a lot of pride in that. I did it because it, it gave me a chance to act a little in a, in a manner where other people might not see that side of me. You know, I, this this thing I do is all about self-expression, you know, kind of like exposing yourself to people and showing who you are. And this gave me a chance to show that I have another side, that I have another quality to me that perhaps they didn't, uh, they didn't think about. Or, or oh, you whatever. obviously do. Sure, we all do. We all have many facets. And that's what I tell. Sometimes uh, they, when I did that show, people would say, well, well, how can you do that? And I'd say, well, use it as a learning tool for your child to show them that people have more than one facet. People are not all monochromatic. They have different aspects to them. And I have this aspect as well as the one you know, the profane one. Hey, but you can walk that line so well. I, I guess that's just a part of being good at what you do. Have you seen the movie The Sixth Sense yet? Uh, yeah, no, you know something? I watched it in a hotel and fell asleep in the middle of it. Not because it was bad, but because it was late. <laughs> but I know the movie that you, you're talking about. Well, it, uh, being a skeptic of the paranormal, I would suggest that movie to you yes. at, at a moment when you can stay awake. Look, it has been... Boy, has it been fun having you on the air. You promised two hours, and that's exactly what you have given me is two hours. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, I really thank you for the chance to... Uh, to, to be myself and uh, to show my uh, flaws and weaknesses and to show some of my strengths and to tell you the things I feel. And I do love your show, and I hope you do it forever and ever. Thank you, George. Thanks. Good night, my friend. Bye-bye. That's, uh, that's George Carlin, as promised. Great guy from Bally's. And now I guess he can kind of wind down a little bit. You do that after a performance. You know, the, uh, the adrenaline is flowing, and there's no way that you're going to go directly to sleep so it's, it's kind of like a racehorse you've got to kind of walk it off and that's what he just did he kind of walked it off now maybe he'll get some sleep good night george from the high desert i'm art bell and this is coast to coast am